There was a stat at the time going around about how many people would die from just safely prescribed medication. And of course, having so many friends as physicians and growing up in the hospital environment, you would see it all the time. These people would just die and there was no reason. They just had that abnormal, that low percentage reaction to that particular medication and they died. And I just couldn't see myself in that space. If I'm an ethical practitioner and I know the truth now about how nutrition does affect our health, for me to leave that component out, again, I would be being unethical. It'd be akin to taking a car with a wheel out of alignment and then just driving it faster down the road. There's still friction there. There's still inflammation there. We're so fat in Mississippi because I can't prescribe you the right medications. In other words, yes, you're right. It's like, okay, I have a problem. Here's a pill. All right. I'm excited today to talk to Dr. Wade Baskin, someone we were just talking off camera. We've been interacting on social media for many, many years now. So it's a pleasure to finally get to discuss with you what's going on. So what just, Wade, where are you located out of curiosity? I don't know where you're at. Yeah, I, I, I pretty much run the state of Mississippi right now. So yeah, I'm in a little place called Louisville, uh, right below Mississippi State University. And so bulldog territory, my friend. I know you're a Texas guy, right? I, I grew up in Texas, so yeah, my allegiance is still somewhat Texas, so yeah. But So you're in Mississippi, and you are a doctor of physical therapy, correct? Is that correct? Yes, you bet. Doctor of physical therapy. Oh. We, we do the doctoring on the physical side of things. We don't do any kind of the medical side of things. We mm -hmm. work with, of course, our medical colleagues quite a bit, and, but it's a little bit of a different way of looking at things, and we'll talk about that a little bit. Yeah, gosh, I use so much. As an orthopedic surgeon, I use a gazillion tons of physical therapy, as you, I'm sure yeah. you're aware. We send you guys tons yeah, of referrals. Well, let me ask you this. Are you, let's see, as far as physical therapy goes, is this the first time you've had a physical therapist on your podcast? I think it is. I, I think it is. So maybe we can I'll, touch I'll on a little bit. What got you into physical therapy then? So I guess that's an interesting question. Okay. Actually, I come from a medical background. My I've got a lot of medical people in my family. My father, in fact, uh, much like yourself, a veteran. He's since passed away, but he's he. I grew up around him being a general surgeon and getting into vascular and thoracic work. And so I grew up with my father being a surgeon. He became somewhat estranged, and so I didn't really have a lot of connect a contact with him toward his lat the latter part of his years. But he was military also, combat veteran, and so I was in that element a good bit. And when I worked my way through college after my first job at Baskin Robbins in uh, high school. <laughs> When I worked my way through college, I was in a respiratory therapy department. I'm also a respiratory therapist, and I actually I fell into that trying to get into medical school. I felt like it would help me move in that direction. And uh, being both a, getting a degree in college and then get, becoming a respiratory therapist helped me get into medical school. And I was almost there. I was applying to medical school, and then something just hit. I just, I was doing it for the wrong reasons. I just did not want to be a physician. I, I couldn't, the, the, the process of prescribing medications, perhaps even doing surgery, much like yourself, which thank you for your service, by the way, in the military and practicing at such a high level there doing surgical procedures. But I, I couldn't see myself doing that and then something go wrong and I'm going to lose somebody. So I know it takes a special person to be able to do it. That just wasn't me. And there I am doing an interview. I was give, being given a tour at uh, University of Mississippi Medical Center. And I was telling Dr. Turner, I, I just said, I don't think I'm going to finish. I don't think I'm going to go to medical school. And he goes, OK, what are you going to do? And I pointed over across the campus and I said, physical therapy, there's something uh, alluring about that to me. I, I really like the concept of physical, uh, the physical element of health. And he said, good luck, because out of every 400 applicants they get, they only accept 20. And they're like, oh, great. So I was very fortunate to get in when I did. And then um, my first day in class, Sean, I, I knew I was in the right place when we started covering anatomy and physiology and just it just took off. And I'm still a, a very active. I've been doing it for over 30 years now. I'm in private practice for over 30 years. And I absolutely love what the, the profession of physical therapy can do for people. And we have a, a little bit of a different look. In medicine, there's injection, medication, surgical procedures. And in physical therapy, we really operate in a lot of gray. And those of us who do outpatient physical therapy, it, it's even a more different world. So I don't do hospital-based. I'm not in a swing bed or a rehab facility or nursing home. I don't do any of that. But yeah, and I've been doing that for 30 years now. So I'm a mechanics guy. I'm all about if you've got a limitation in your motion, if you have an ache or pain or something that's keeping you from being able to function like you really want, then I'm your guy. We're your facility. You want to come. 
or if you have an imbalance like uh, vertigo or things like that, we take on a lot of problems that, in, that involve the vestibular system too. Yeah, interesting. I, I guess I went into orthopedics and I'm thinking about the number of patients that, that I saw die. It wasn't very many, honestly. When I was at war, we had more because the yeah. wounds were so horrific. But in general, I, I can I, I, I can remember operating on some really, really, really old people that had really bad injuries, and occasionally one of those would die. But it was I could count on the number of hand my, my hand one one hand the number of people I can think remember that died in the U.S. outside of war zones where you know that some of them were right. just unsalvageable. But so obviously, okay. well, I mean, obviously, there's a traditional. You mentioned the gray areas in physical therapy. So I guess maybe I could delve into more of that because I know there's different, oh gosh, there's so many different modalities that are out there that physical therapists, right. some use, some don't, some different techniques. Maybe, what do you mean by gray areas? Okay. And to kind of take just a half step back there, when you were asking me about why I become a physical therapist and what led me to that, uh, there was a, 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 med, a, a stat at the time going around about how many people would die from just safely prescribed medications. And of course, having so many friends as physicians and growing up in the hospital environment, you would see it all the time. These people would just, they would die and there was no reason. They just had that abnormal, that low percentage reaction to that particular medication and they died. And I just couldn't see myself in that space, practicing in that way. As much as I wanted the knowledge that a physician had, the actual practice of it, I, I couldn't bring myself to just go in that direction. I felt like I was doing it for the wrong reason because my dad did it. I've been around it. All my mentors are physicians. So, but anyway, I'm, I guess that makes me the dumb one in the family. <laughs> but yeah, to, to mention, to talk about the gray area there, I, man, I thrive in the gray. And that's that where it's just not black and it's just not white. There's something causing your dysfunction, your pain, whereas a physician might call it let's say you have rotator cuff tendinopathy, okay, or rotator cuff tear, let's say, or just shoulder pain, and, and then they don't really, let's say it's your family physician, they call it shoulder pain, they send you to the physical therapist, now it's my job to figure out, okay, what is actually causing that? And so we get into the mechanics of it, but we dive a little deeper at our practice, and this is just, this is my beef with my whole profession. Here we are, physical therapists, doctors of physical therapy now, I got to see all that happen and be a part of it. And you would think that with the word prevention in the definition of a physical therapist, we are part of our definition. Part of the definition is prevention of disease prevention. And we even talk about prevention of chronic disease. OK, now we get much like physicians, we get about a day or a day and a half or an elective in nutrition. Right. And that what did you get in medical school what, as far as nutrition goes? Yeah, I wouldn't much. I can't remember the exact. It's certainly less than a week. I can't remember. It right. was, it was of, we glossed uh, over it. Yeah. And then of what you get, it's more like along the lines of USDA kind of regulations. <laughs> so, yeah, it was a lot of, you know, a lot of it like pellagra and scurvy and berry, berry, just weird vitamin deficiencies that you never see in, pra in all practicality. I never really see it clinically in the U.S. So it was right. not very practical. And ours, ours is very, the ones that are getting it now and the new PTs that are coming out, they're getting that either elective a day to a week of nutrition and it's really a, a very plant-based approach using it's all this balance stuff everybody's still trying to balance it out trying to get all those little food groups in. got to make sure you get those grains and it's how are we as a group of physical therapists supposed to help people really overcome these musculoskeletal problems that many times come from like autoimmune issues that are undiagnosed and so we dive in a little deeper at our practice and and i, I don't make a huge deal out of it but we definitely cover it. And that is we do cover what they are eating. We make sure they're getting enough protein. Number one, of course, I'm a, being a carnivore fan. I wouldn't call myself a fan anymore. I'm just, that is a, and some people just call it a way of eating. It's basically our, our species specific. Our diet is primarily carnivore. And then we're opportunistic on everything else. Maybe a little fruit, which yes, we're designed to handle quite well, but we look at their overall dietary setup there. What are you eating? We do a three-day food journal many times, and I like to see what's going on with their diet. Most of the time, you can track back just about every problem they've had to the lack of nutrition they've been getting. And, you know, even to the point where I, I decided, hey, look, let's go study functional medicine, too. And I did that. And, buddy, you want to talk about going down a rabbit hole of things. I mean, you can – functional medicine, I thought it would add an element of – of a value to my practice, being able to help patients even more, not only just lose weight. And I'm in Mississippi, so that's a, you know, I've got mm -hmm. clients all over the place regarding 
obese. Yeah, I think, correct me but, if I'm uh, obesity. Uh, Mississippi might be one of the most obese states in the U.S. If I'm not mistaken, we, we used to. Too. Yeah, man, we used to lead the way, but we've had a two or three other states beating us out: New Mexico, Virginia. Uh, every now and then, Alabama pokes their head up a little bit. <laughs> so, yeah, we're no longer the absolute leader. We keep getting beat down to about third place. But look, I've got my one in three people. Yeah, it's it's happening here. One in three people are diabetic around me have had some kind of cardiovascular problem, overweight. Mm. So I do a live radio show too on Fridays, which it was, I did it this morning. My, I had to step out and too much like you did, Sean, and you did it in a very dramatic way. I had to step out of my traditional training. I had to use the the training that I got in order to, we know how to read research. At doctorate levels, you, you know how to discern good from bad. And I started this wellness program a long time ago to try to help people with their nutrition. And I, it was just a struggle because that's what you do on plant-based. I was struggling. You just, you're trying to figure all this nutrition stuff out and getting into the micronutrition of things. And you're just struggling. And these people have these autoimmune disorders. Their joints are falling apart. They feel terrible. They have fatigue, malaise, and blah, blah, blah. It goes down the road. And you just say, maybe we need to double down. Let's juice those carrots. And then you get into juicing. And that's, <laughs> you can't even absorb beta carotene or uh, assimilated. But here we are. We're just struggling and struggling. And I studied functional medicine and it was this, you really get that. You really dive deep on their overall diet then and lifestyle. And I found that if you just step back, if you just, and you can use your doctorate level research capabilities to do this, you just step back and look at use the scientific method, not evidence-based, but scientific method and just see what's working and what doesn't. And you'll find that Boy, there's just so much struggle when you're trying to do the low fat, low sodium, high vegetation, plant based. There's just so much struggle. And then when people are eating a little bit more protein in their diet, less of that, they just seem to do better. And I noticed that. Yeah, when it comes, I was going to comment on the tissue quality because clearly, gosh, we call these people with triple P piss poor protoplasm because it's like no yeah, matter what you do to them, they're, right, right, they're, right, they're yeah. going to fall apart. They're just horrible. It's just, we do have I mean, a protoplasm not, rating in our clinic. Oh yeah, absolutely. We have all kinds yeah, of things. Like yeah. That. yeah people that like, walking across the street, they start falling apart, which is unfortunate. It's not a slight to the person personality or anything, but it's just the reality of the situation. It is. And, and I think the number one problem we have, and, and you know, this as well as I do, I think the number one problem is that our average, po the, the people in our population, the, the, the greatest amount of people in our population, they don't associate their health with their diet. They, and that's the way our medical system is set up. And, and I'm part of that too. I'm in a mainstream, I'm a licensed physical therapist. I have regulations over me. We're basically waiting for you to fall apart. And then we're going to patch you up and put you back out there and say, keep going. Okay. So that's what I see mainstream medical practice as we're waiting for these people to fall apart and then they come in, oh yeah, you're pre-diabetic, now you're diabetic, now we can really jump in there and manage this progressive disease, which I do not believe that it is. And of course, when Harvard did contributed down the uh, carnivore study and showed that, what was it, 93% were no longer diabetic after that? Is that correct? I was 92% of type twos yeah. came off insulin and 100% came off all the other injectables. Right, and, and we still don't all, say we're, yeah. right. And we still don't say we're curing it, but they're no longer diabetic. They're no longer on insulin. They're no longer taking their medication. Their A1C is like in the five range or less. These and, and I'm seeing that day to day here. I see people shift from that standard American diet or even more of a plant based diet. And I see people starting to shift. And as they shift, not only do they get healthier and they start thriving more, they actually you start using some of your traditional measures such as a calcium score their calcium scores start coming down. I've got people my age, I'm 50, I think I'm about your age, I'm 56. And everybody I graduated with, I've had, I've actually had my class coming to me saying, hey, I met Steve down the road and he said, you, you helped him clear up his arteries. What did you do? <laughs> Honestly, it's not that hard. There's such power and simplicity. And that's what I love about the carnivore diet, if you will. If you can just find a way to wean people into, that's the hard part is wean, the weaning. But the actual doingness of it, the process of just being on a carnivore based diet, it's pretty simple. And there's a lot of power, no confusion. It's very simple. And people don't, they just can't grasp that. They need that confusion. They need to make it complicated. Like our politicians, oh, it's complicated, right? <laughs> and, and that's what I, as a physical therapist, I had to step back out of my profession 
uh, and, and, and medicine as well. And just look at it from a realistic perspective. Look for truth. A lot of people use their training, but that's fine. Use your training to find the truth. And when you do, you find yourself moving in a different direction. And you do have to be careful because, yeah, you are licensed and you got regulations on you. And you can get beat up if you try to be a nutritious a nutritionist in a state that won't allow that. But yeah, yeah I, I, had to, I had to get out of it. I had to just get out of the traditional mainstream medical model and physical therapy model and bring in some truthful information to really help people, to actually help people, not use a dogmatic approach, which I was doing. I even lost my health, man. I even got up to, I'm a little five, seven, small little Neanderthal here that got up to 191 pounds and couldn't turn my head. I had loss of range of motion everywhere. I had autoimmune issues. I had seborrheic dermatitis. Pre, I had metabolic syndrome. I, my girth was 40 inches. <laughs> so it's terrible. So carnivore, keto, and then going, I did the same thing a lot of people do. I found keto and that made sense. And then I found carnivore, which made even more sense when you look at human history. And anthropology is one of my favorite fields of additional study. And you just, if you just pay attention there, you'll find that way our, our, the way we're eating now, the way we exist now, our modernness of our food supply and everything, everything's around us. We no longer have to hunt or do anything for our food. It's just around us. And we're so addicted to those things. But our genetics are still back over here saying, we're prepared for you to go without food for a while. And when you do it, it's going to be more of a meat or a fat-based, protein and fat-based diet. You're going to eat an animal. So yeah, yeah sure. we're all messed up. <laughs> yeah, it's I, just going back to the tissue stuff. When I look at tissue repair, and oh, yeah. obviously we're made out of animal cells, right? That's pretty, pretty yeah, obvious. Absolutely. We're not plants. And when I'm looking at what do I need to rebuild animal so I use the analogy of if I'm going to build a brick house, it'd be nice to have bricks. So if you got bricks, it makes it easier to build a brick house. But if you got straw and mud, and that's the analogy of the plant. So you got to do a lot to make those things into something that's usable. And so I think that's a, yeah, really it's just did. more, it's, it's just more efficient doing, doing a lot of meat, I think. So that helps. And how you said you had to step away from the, and, and I, and I realize, you know, like some states, you, you, even physicians aren't allowed to be dietitians. I think most of them, sure. I look at that because every time I put a patient in the hospital, I had to order a diet. I would, I just, I had to feed them. So right. I was like, when, in right. news, it was just like, whatever, they're diabetic, you get them on, you get them an ADA 60 gram carb thing or something like that there wasn't a there wasn't a meat-based diet i can tell you that's for sure but oh, I know. anyway yeah, so right. we so, so, we're, right. so yeah so by necessity we have to delve, delve into nutrition at least a little bit and then of course i chose to do it in a much bigger way how so how does that work in your current practice because obviously you've got the the physical therapy prescriptions and all the various yes. different techniques you have but are you able to you said you take food logs and most people are eating yeah. pure garbage i'm sure and how do you incorporate that because it's challenging and you're if you're not set up for, that's why we that's one of the reasons we set up rivero is because the whole company is designed around nutrition and we have we because when i was practicing as an orthopedic surgeon the best i could do is hand out flyers take google read this book or watch this video i don't have the the luxury of the time and the coaching staff and all the resources resources that I now do. So how do you do it? What are you doing? Okay. And that's a, that's a good point. Yeah. Physicians only have what spend on average about five or so minutes with a client or a patient up to 15 minutes. If you're a family practitioner or nurse practitioner, that's still not a lot of time to really do nutritional consultation or lifestyle changes much less. And it was interesting. I was at a, a meeting not too long ago, a physical therapy meeting, and there was a medical meeting going on in the same uh, facility. And there were like 1500 physicians over there. And I said, what is that? And it was, you'll, I shat you not. They were in their learning. It was a nutrition based lifestyle change process for family physicians to actually figure out how to integrate this stuff and get paid for it. Cause that's the reason most physicians don't, they, there's no way to get paid for administering lifestyle change processes and, and giving nutritional guidance. Yeah. There's, but I was, I saw 1,500 physicians over there, and here's my profession. We got the word prevention in our definition, and we haven't done anything uh, even close to that. But if you truly want to help a patient, then, and just like you said, with t the tissue quality, so the quality of that person, the quality of their tissue, the quality of their physiology coming into my practice is going to be very low. How can I get the best outcome possible as I move them forward? Let's say it's a chronic problem, chronic low back pain. We see that all the time. Stenosis, DJD, degenerative disc disease, sciatica, sacroiliac dysfunction, all those key things there. 
we see that nonstop and technically by research, you're not supposed to be able to change that. You're not supposed to be able to help them. You got to teach them how to manage it and deal with it. But we change it every day. We practice regenerative type approaches to recovery. Now, when we do that, I need them to have the best nutrition status possible. Granted, if they're very poor, we're going to have a poor outcome. But if I can change it in some way, maybe get some more protein. I use simple words with my patients. I, re- I never say, all right, I'm going to put you on the carnivore diet. <laughs> they don't know what that means. But what I will say is I'll look at their protein and see how much protein they're not getting and say, well, you need at least this much. So we start teasing them into it. So to answer your question, how do I integrate that? I don't do a full nutritional consult. And that's, again, it's going to take away from what my role really is and what I get paid to do and what I'm regulated on. But I have to, if I'm an ethical practitioner and I know the truth now about how nutrition does affect our health, for me to leave that component out, again, I would be being unethical knowing that I'm just going to, it'd be akin to taking a car with a wheel out of alignment and then just driving it faster down the road. There's still friction there. There's still inflammation there. What if I can slightly affect that or majorly affect that if they really click and they buy into it because a lot of older people, they've never eaten that much protein that they need. If their requirement is 80 grams, they've probably never done that in their entire life. And they're probably at a point where they don't even like meat anymore. And we see that a lot like, oh, I can barely eat it. I can barely chew it and barely swallow it. And these are 70 year old people. They're not even that old. But yeah, I what I do is I like to, I have a handout, and like what you said, a pamphlet. Right. But I I have a little handout, but we go through a discussion really quick. I get a verbal. uh, We do a verbal exchange. I do a little subjective history on what a tradition, what typically their diet looks like during the day. I like to know when they eat too, when they eat what. And then I have a little three day food journal and we look at it. And then what we try to do is tease in more protein at first, because I know that's going to help me. Sometimes it even leads to possible collagen supplementation. I don't try to get big in the supplements. Boy, if you're in functional medicine, you do. But I try to really get just good nutrient-dense protein, which is, of course, going to be on the red meat side of the equation. Uh, You just can't beat that. Now, if you talk to Saldino, he's probably going to talk about liver and all that. I'm Just get the meat. It's something they're familiar with. So that's my basic, that's my main approach there is find out a little bit about what they're doing put it together in a program where I'm going to try to get more protein in. And then as we get through there and they start noticing, Hey, this, I can do this. And I am getting, they get, get results in their therapy program. Then we start introducing them to other concepts about here's some foods to avoid. We might even go, we get into nightshades, of course, vegetable oil. I'm on a mission to get that stuff just removed. And of course that is not going to happen in probably our lifetime because that's what one third of our diet now. And there's so much money into it. And, It's like this, it's like we're you and our community, we're this special forces group and we're surrounded by these huge vegetable based armies. And we've got the the nutrition. We're kind of like Genghis Khan. We've got the warriors here (laughs) and we could kick all their asses, but there's a lot of them, man. (laughs) Yeah. It's just a matter of, our side is growing every day. So that's good. I mean, it's. yeah. And I appreciate your uh, man starting Rivero. What I know you're interviewing me, but I've just got to find out what led you to do that. That's a great move. That's what led you to say, I need an organization that, that's going to promote this and get it to professional. It's it's ever since I realized that how damn near impossible it was for me to engage in truly meaningful lifestyle medicine within the context of the standard allopathic practice. As you mentioned, as an orthopedic surgeon, I got 50 patients on my schedule. I can't take 20, 30 minutes to discuss nutrition. I got to be in and out. And so I, I, and then even if I did, I'm like, there's no resources for these people, no credit. I bet you send them to the nutritionist who's going to give you the standard American diet food pyramid advice, which is often not helpful for a sick person. I knew the need was there for many years. It's just It's a lot of work to do it. Hiring engineers to build a platform, hiring clinicians, raising the money to do it. It took a long time to get it done. So this is something. And my partner, to be fair, she wanted to do something. We weren't sure what it was going to look like. And there was evolution. But once we decided that we had to engage in medical practice, we couldn't just do coaching. That's good, but it has its limitations. And there's a lot of people that need the actual full medical service and what we can offer now. But that's that's one thing I was going to comment because I 
for the first time in my life, I actually went to a physical therapist. I hurt my neck. I had a little cervical radiculopathy from jujitsu. Yeah. And I got the neuros, not the neuros, the orthopedic spine surgeon said, Hey, once you go to, go to your, go to a PT, which I was fine with. And, but the one thing, and I know this is the case, often we'll get patients. They'll be authorized for, I don't know, 12 visits or something like that. So you right. get maybe once a week, you get to see the same patient over and over again. So you have a little bit more. And while you're doing, I'm sure during the session, doing whatever, warming up and doing all the different therapy mm-hmm. modalities you got you can talk to these people for you've got them captured for maybe an hour at a I time did, or right. half an and hour I see them two to three is, times a week yes mm-hmm. yeah so that's pretty cool so you can ask because where's me I, at the best i might see somebody for 10 minutes one day and i won't see them again for three months and it's really frack it's really uh, hard to have a good sort of rapport yes, I'm, like a, i'm uh, we're there's a few of us in my profession that that recognize this and we do we have a captured audience there in fact in a busy clinic like i'm in a rural area but I, I'm surrounded by like big hospital systems. My immediate area, I've got about six to 10,000 people. But my clinic operates like I am in a metro area. I have people that come from a long way off to get services here. Like you said, you had a cervical radiculopathy. We're known for our, well, I'm a spine specialist. I'm what's called an osteopractor, which is extra over and above training, being a doctor of physical therapy. Medical doctors and doctors of PT can go get this specialized credential and, and it's clinical. You are training in the latest and greatest in diagnosing and treating spine and extremity dysfunction using like spinal manipulation, special instruments and things like that. So yeah, we have in a busy clinic, we'll have me and my other therapist and I will have at, at any time we might have 10 people in the clinic. And of course, if they, if we have them like between private rooms, if we have them in that gym area, Oh, we get in these robust discussions about, what I said on my radio show last week, or somebody had a question about, do I need to take vitamin C? And they'll bring their little pills in. Oh, it just starts this great discussion. And then we get people opening their eyes that we start talking about and giving examples of people in the community who have fixed their diabetes, who did drop 50 pounds, who did, who are no longer suffering with that arthritis in their back or their knee. They avoided the knee replacement. And we simply made some nutrition changes. They want to know, what did you do? So that's how we're and we're able to really get that word out. It's a small thing compared to the big national scene, which is what you're going to be able to help quite a bit. But we're getting that word out gradually, like, look, there's a better way. And it's not about eating more vegetables and things like that. And no, it's really we need to start thinking different. And I'm in a religious area, too. And I'll I'll associate it with that, the way God designed us. We are basically meat, protein and salt. I use simple Mm -hmm. words. And so those are good elements for us. And we need to make sure we're getting good sources of that. And I'm real fortunate, Sean, we have in our area, we have local farmers. And so if the grid goes down, man, look, we're good here. We're fine. People in these metro areas and these largely populated areas, I feel bad for them because they depend on people like us to get the food to them. But we are good. We have so many sources of meat here. We can't get raw dairy in my state, which is unfortunate for those who do dairy. So we try to bring it in from other places and work out deals with some farmers where you can voluntarily go get some raw dairy. I think that's just an amazing substance that we've since vilified. If you really look at it uh, from a common sense perspective, if you just look at what's going on here, we've moved so far away from what would be considered normal and healthy. We've moved so far away from that, that to return to a species specific approach almost looks crazy. Oh, meat only? That's going to clog your arteries. You're going to die. They're so Everybody's so brainwashed. So we have to gently rewash their brain into a, a remembering of sorts. Like, hey, look, you're actually designed by God to eat these things. And that's why when you ate your steak last night, Mr. Beef Rancher, uh, that's why when you ate your steak and you left off the bread and the toast and the potatoes, you didn't have heartburn in that one night. And that just recently happened, by the way. He's a beef farmer. And he's overweight, having all these problems, Crohn's, IBS, you name it. And I just, I'm sitting there just shaking my head. Oh my gosh, this guy's a beef farmer. And I just told him, I said, you basically have the superfood of the gods right in your backyard and you get it for free. I said, why don't you just do this just tonight? Leave off your, all the other stuff. Just eat that steak. And he goes, oh, that'll be no problem. I said, great. So he did it. And he came back the next day and was blown away. His eyes were wide and he's like, you're not going to believe this. I didn't have heartburn last night. I've had it for 10 years every night. Like, yeah, it's that simple. <laughs> and now, by the way, he's, this was four weeks ago. 
he's, that's all he does. He's a born again, he's a carnivore <laughs> and he's so healthy. He's dropped like 20 pounds and he's just feeling great. He couldn't believe it. And I was, now they wanted me to come talk to their ranchers association. And I'm like, Hey, put me there because they get so much negative news, negative press, negativity towards them. They're a class two carcinogen promoter. They, they it's just so, we're just so bass backwards right now. So somebody has got to do something. I appreciate your work and I'm doing my part. <laughs> yeah, Bass Act for just a good way to put it. Yeah, it's and it's funny because I've talked to a number of cattlemen's groups over the years, and I, I'm up there telling them, "Hey, look, this is actually extremely powerful health food." And they look at me like blank, like what? I didn't know that. Know. It's surprised because you're like, well, you're out here producing this stuff, and you should know that you're producing the healthiest food on the planet, basically. And it's we call know, it a, a full elimination approach when when you were talking about how I approach our patients with it. Once we get them to a certain point, we actually how. In functional medicine, they'll have an elimination diet. You're, I'm sure you're familiar with that, right? Mm -hmm. and, but if you look at what that is, what does it entail? It's like all kinds of little vegetation and broths and stuff. It's That's not an elimination diet. We're only designed, what, we can only eat 1% of plant life on earth and about 99% of it will kill you. <laughs> Plants, any kind of plant life, any kind of vegetation, I, I don't consider that a good elimination diet because you're probably reacting to some of the anti-nutrients there. We don't know. So a full elimination diet to us, what I've designed, is a gradual progression into a very strict carnivore approach. That's full elimination because even your MDs, your allergy guys, they'll tell you like the number one food that no one reacts to with the exception of if you have alpha-gal syndrome or something like that, it's, it's meat. And ready, you just don't react to it. And now I know there are some, and if you have mast cell activation syndrome and they, you get it from a USDA facility, yeah, the citric acid or whatever they're using on the steak, you might react to. But as far as just getting an animal, eating that, cooking that meat and eating that meat, you're not going to react to it. It's some of this is just almost common sense once you see it. But yeah, like I said, we are a little bass backwards now and to try to redirect that. It's a big battle and it's a lot of, and it's basically based on money, profit margin, because there's so much more profit margin in grains than there are like beef in the beef industry. And the, yeah, and the well, cow was, population's dying and the beef consumption's down and yet they're blaming cows for the environment. Cow farts right. are supposed to be hurting our environment, but we don't even have as many cows and we don't consume as much meat. And the societies that do consume more meat, they're living, Hong Kong, they're living longer than anybody. And the blue zones, that was a bunch of, Hooey right there. Those guys were actually eating meat too. I'm just, I'm jaded. <laughs> yeah. It's hard not to be when, because like you said, you're looking for the truth and obviously <clears throat> it's hard as a physician that sees patients repeatedly come in again. I've seen, I've been seeing this for gosh, almost a decade now. People seriously getting objectively by every metric significantly better by just eating meat. And if I had to wait for an RCT or some approved American Heart Association study to do this, no one would go anywhere. You'd never get any results. And so sometimes you have to say, look, the science is got some significant limitations on it. I can use it as a tool, but it's not my only tool. And I can actually, back in the day, physicians and other healthcare providers would observe their patients and make decisions based on what they're actually seeing. And now we're being told what to think, right? We're being told how to think. And we're like, this doesn't line up with what you told me. This shut up and keep doing what we're saying anyway. Here's a here's an electronic medical record with an algorithm you have to follow. And oh, by the way, we're going to tag some of your pay to that. It's just, it's interesting to see how this happened there. Do you yeah. find, does the, and I don't know who the governing body of physical therapy, the American mm -hmm. Physical Therapy Association, so right. that, yeah, do they have a, do they have a nutritional belief system? Are they just US, USDA food pyramid or do they even talk about No, that? they just tell us you have to go to special coursework and it's usually sponsored by the private practice association. There's not there. It to answer your question. No, there's nothing right now, but there is an element. There is a process going on where there are like-minded physical therapists, me being one of them that are saying we need something and we're starting to come together on it. There is a little tug and pull because some of these people are, they're coming in from that vegan plant base. They're, they're coming in from that side saying, Oh yes, we need more nutrition training. I'm like, now it's this battle. It's like, which way do we lean with it? In my profession, largely I, I, a lot of this boils down to politics and they come from that. They come from the left side of the equation where they are They're They're really pushing that dogma on plant-based and me having been there and lost my health doing that and had so many clients struggle doing that. 
And now having seen the results I've gotten and with my clients, there's no way I'm going to allow my profession to try to come up with some regulation type stuff or come up with some dietary information that's going to make me have to go back to that again. No way. Absolutely not. And I'm, there's about, I think the percentage of us is probably on the low end. I think it's about 30 of us, 30% of us against about 70% of them. So I don't think anything's going to happen anytime soon. So I've just had to take it on my own to go ahead and help my community in a very truthful, ethical, honest way and stay within regulations. So I don't get in any kind of trouble, of course, and still do great physical therapy with them being properly or best getting the best fuel I can in them. So their cells are better cells. So their responses are better responses. Their inflammation levels go down. That's a key thing. Their bloat goes down. You can call it a detox diet or whatever, but when we get them really on that carnivore side of the equation, they just become healthier humans and everything starts to improve other than as yeah, the cholesterol thing. And I'm just, that's a whole other discussion right there. But yeah, they start saying, my doctor said everything looks good, but he wants to put me on a statin. <laughs> yeah, I understand. And no, yeah, one that's, a, yeah that's, an, that's obviously the, probably of all things that scare people away from eating more meat or a meat-based diet is every, cholesterol. Every I mean, time. Because, that is our number one. Yeah. If I were to call it down, that's our number one. When they do it, they go to their physician. They're really excited about how good they're doing their weight, everything, their, their testosterone level, you name it, everything's good. And then they go, but you got it. Your cholesterol is too high. So we got to put you on a statin. And they asked me, should I do it? Now, now that puts me in a role that I don't like being mm -hmm. in because there are some regulations there, but I give them some information on it. I sure do. Yeah, I think obviously, and God bless those guys, Dave Feldman and, and Matt yeah. Budoff and the other guys that are doing this research right now that may provide some more guidance with that. Because I think the, I've mentioned so many times, I don't think you can ignore cholesterol, but I think there's a lot of nuance, which is not being relayed to people and hopefully we'll have, yeah. you know, when you, when I went to medical school initially back in the 1980s, I remember, that, and this is when statins just came out. I, I had, I remember physicians talking about it here as a me young medical student, hearing these family practice doctors just talking and saying, "I think statins should be put in the drinking water." They were that right. sold right. on it back then. Mm -hmm. It was because it, there was obviously a big PR push, and there's a lot of propaganda. Every time a new drug comes out, it's the greatest thing ever, and it's going to save everybody, and no one's going to be. We continue to see this, and at the end of the day, long term follow up always results in disappointment, more side effects, less efficacy than we were told. And you can just see that ad nauseum over and over again. But yeah, it's a challenging situation for sure. I want to go back to the protein thing a little bit because yeah. mm -hmm. there's not a lot of talk about protein. I know like when you're looking at a surgical candidate, you have a lot of people that some doctors will look at like a serum albumin level, which will be low, and then they don't have right. the healing capacity. And some of that may reflect protein in the diet, or there's different ind nutritional indices when you're examining how much, what their muscle mass in their arm looks like and things mm -hmm. like that. But rarely, as an orthopedic surgeon, I was never really told or taught in any significant way that, hey, perioperatively or peri-injury wise, they need more protein, but clearly they do. I think the literature actually suggests a 10 to 15 increase percent increase in protein consumption during some sort of healing process. And I don't yes. know if that's, is that, do you have literature on that or do you guys have a- No, I remember, I, I think I've read probably the same material you have, but I don't use that clinically. Hey, I need to get your protein. They're already so deficient, like mm. just in general, like they're getting 15, 35 grams a day. And so I basically, I'm, I'm, trying to find ways to find foods that they currently like that are good to maybe add more and, and remove some of the other stuff. I know if I can add more protein and get them to that. Of course, the metric you probably know of is what one gram or uh, yeah, it's going to be one gram per pound of ideal body weight. That's the simple way to look at it. That's the way my patients, they'll understand that. I don't use the kilograms. No, I do one gram per pound of ideal body weight. And then I'll take about 0.5 to 0.8 of that to keep it realistic for them because they're so far down here to try to put them at 80 grams of protein. And they've been eating like 30 and 40 to put them at 80 is almost impossible when we look at the food sources. And of course, meat being, or especially steak being a really nutrient dense way to do it. They've never eaten that much before. That's my big challenge. But yes, when I can get that extra protein in them, they do heal better. And that's, I do encourage, and this is where some carnivore people, some clinicians sway on this, but 
collagen supplementation, I found that an easy way to at least get some protein in them starting in the day, like maybe just put it in their coffee. And this is frontline stuff. I know where we want to be, but to try to get them started and moving in that direction and feeling a result and actually noticing, hey, I do feel better when I leave this off and I add this in, then the ball, that it's that principle of inertia. Once you get the ball rolling, then it's easier. So yeah, that protein, I, I do educate them on that. I want to try to get as close to if their ideal body weight is say 150, I'm trying to get as close to that as I can on grams of protein, but good protein, not those little shakes that they're all taught that they need to do. And they're all drinking protein shakes around here, Insure and Boost, mm. you name it. So therein lies another discussion. And we try to move away from that and change it over to this. One of my best ways, most everybody around here likes eggs. And of course they like steak, but they say they can't afford it. Mm. And we have the economic discussion on how that actually works out to save you money later. But uh, yeah, I'll always add an egg and here, take out, just leave off the, just do half a biscuit tomorrow and just add another egg. <laughs> We're trying to get rid of the biscuits and try to put in the eggs. And that's successful. We've had a lot of great success with that. Yeah, it's, it's shocking because for me, I, I, if if I cook eggs, it's, I'm not eating less than six. It's just, I'm not even going to bother turning the stove on unless I'm eating at least six eggs. Yes. And there's people who will, will really start, once you say eat more than two eggs, or be like, oh my God, that's a lot of eggs. And they're freaked out. Well, then that's only 12 grams of protein. It's, it's, it's not a lot of protein. protein. That's like, the thing. It's, yeah, it's not, a, it's not enough. It's not a lot. And they're, of course, still, I don't, this is still around. Oh, it's got cholesterol in it. I'm like, oh, okay, so here we go again. And cholesterol I have to tell them, now, look, when you eat cholesterol, it doesn't go into elevating your cholesterol. But uh, what I try to educate them on eventually is I'll say, here's how I use cholesterol. And here's how this is proven. And this is a very, you can go look this up. It's all over Google. I use the, the triglyceride ACL ratio and I teach them the numbers where they should be. And it's always about getting the triglycerides down. That's the key thing is getting the triglycerides down. That's the only valid way I like to use cholesterol. I don't use the LDL or the the total cholesterol, I'll tell them to bring me their cholesterol numbers, and they'll bring them. And then I'll, we'll do an H, we'll do the ratio there and see where they are. And of course, if they're above two, then we start having conversations about how to get that down. If they're four, then we really we set them up. We get a little more serious then. Like they're that's not good. And of course, we take a belly girth measurement. And I do this is the only thing I use from the World Health Organization about right now is that belly girth measurement at the umbilicus if it's 40 inches or more okay mm -hmm. we got to get that down right now so that's yeah. a little bit about our approach there you'd met you'd mentioned you have a you're in the south there's probably a lot of i don't know baptists and other folks <laughs> different religions down there and last time i read the bible and it's been a little while but i have read it <laughs> a few times over the years there's a lot of talk about meat in there. And are you able to, uh, I guess some of those people would say, look, God was always having people there. They're always sacrificing animals and having big feasts. And I guess yeah. there's some, you can use that, I suppose. We have, I actually do. We have people that are smarter than me that know that they have those biblical expression. They have, they know the book, the chapter, they can sit there and quote stuff. And I'll ask them, I don't even try, I, I need to go look it up and put it all on one sheet of paper or two or three sheets of paper. I need to go get all those phrases, all those little biblical writings about how meat was used and revered as that's the prize food, everything else. Yeah, whatever. But meat and what it represented was, yes, the prize. And that's also very tribal and primal, too. In any hunter-gatherer society, in any society whatsoever, when the food came in to the village, whatever you want to call or tribe, and if it wasn't meat, they were not very happy. They had plenty of vegetation. They had plenty of roots. They had plenty of fruits. They had all that stuff, and they were dying of poor health until the meat comes in. They were very, they, every, you innately revere meat. You, Rivera, is that what you call it, Rivera, by the way? I'm curious. What came up with that? How did you come up with the name Rivera? Oh, gosh. So that was a, a Rivera. It was an interesting process because we wanted something that, didn't really mean anything because obviously there's things that have a, a negative connotation in some concept and it's biases things and we've seen the successful companies that have had that have gone really big have you think about google and all these companies that their name doesn't really mean anything and we had to go through and find out find things that one weren't already being used in fact we had to pay there's a car called rivero believe it or not and we had to we yeah. had to, there's a there's a okay. sports car 
And so we had to end up, we ended up having to buying the rights for the name and we had to make sure it like, it wasn't, it didn't mean something offensive in another language. And it was just really a, a interesting exercise. I remember we spent about a week coming up with that name and we had a list of the top 50 names and that's what we decided. And Rivero got reverses in there because we're, I think we're reversing disease. And from the French, dreaming is, is rev, so la rev or something like that. There's, I don't know. It's, I think it just evolved that way and I can't remember. But I got you. it's, okay. a, a lot of people didn't like it at first. We were meet up, meet RX. It really meant we're prescribing meat. But then we were looking at how do we, because like you liked what? I like that meat RX is because I, I've no, I was a lot seeing of people did. A lot, yeah. yeah, a lot of people did. But the problem with, that was particularly as you go to investors, there's always this bias against that. So we were trying to figure out something that wouldn't immediately set off a red flag and we get right. rejected. Yeah, and then also, yeah. and then we're not just using carnivore diets. We're using those when indicated, but we're doing an approach where we're getting rid of the junk and increasing the protein in many cases and some low carb elimination strategies. And then some people will funnel into carnivore if they need it, particularly certain autoimmune conditions. Some people will need that. Right. So it, it, it's just more all-encompassing what we do, I think. So that's the sort of the origin of the genesis of the name. Very good. And you were mentioning earlier about some of the medications and how we get really uh, pulled into that. I've, and, and you go down this road and it turns into more and more. Uh, right now, I think our biggest challenge in the, in the health and weight loss industry is really the uh, Ozempic and the Marjuros and things like that. We're, that is pervasive in my community right now. We, we're having a mm. lot of utilization of those medications there to drop pounds yeah I'll, I'll be curious to see obviously there's going to be the patients where they're going to have success with that there's going to be a number of patients that can't tolerate it can't afford it have significant side effects some very serious and and probably you know very negative in many cases yeah that's my concern and then, and then what is going to be the long term? Because the data they've got one year, two year data follow up where it mostly shows, particularly as they come off the drugs, they, they mostly just gain it back. And so it's being proposed as like a diabetic drug, you just take it the rest of your life. And oh, by the way, it's a thousand dollars a month or some ridiculous cost. And so I mean, I'm sure the, the cost will come down somewhat, but it'll still be a huge, as, as like I said, we're training people to be with this expectation that they are powerless to do anything you know but you're obese it's not your fault there's nothing you can do about it, it happens to everybody it's just normal and here take this drug and and, that, and that's what people are being literally propagandized or brainwashed into believing and i think that um either maybe they get pulled from the market from too many negative outcomes you know the, the fact that they're making tens and probably ultimately hundreds of billions of dollars is going to be a big disincentive to pull it off the market because the, the company would rather maybe they kill a handful of people maybe they kill a few thousand people and they just pay the fine they'll just pay the, they'll pay the three three billion dollar fine and in they know that 2020 right. in, in 2030 they'll pay the three billion dollar fine and laugh their way to the bank and no one will get fired and no one will go to jail and i don't know it's just going to there but, I, I, I mean i'm sure like i mean, said mm -hmm. no go ahead i was gonna say in, in our state we literally had i don't know the name of this practitioner of course i wouldn't say it here but there was a nurse practitioner in, in uh, our capital area, in the Jackson area, that was a member and is a member of the American Association of Nurse Practitioners. This is where I saw her in a forum. And she was literally, we there was some legislation dictating what they could and couldn't prescribe. And she was very upset. And she's a leader in the health and wellness space for nurse practitioners. And she said the reason, she was literally blaming the obesity epidemic on the legislation that would not let them prescribe off-label medications that would mitigate their 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 weight in, in some way. They, In other words, she was saying, we're so fat in Mississippi because I can't prescribe you the right medications. In other words, yes, you're right. It's like, okay, I have a problem. Here's a pill. Yep, we're not allowed to prescribe enough pills, so you're just going to keep having that problem. I didn't know what to, I didn't even know where to start that conversation. I'm like, oh my goodness. So she really thinks, there's nothing to have to do with lifestyle whatsoever. There's nothing to have to do with anything other than, oh, she needs to be able to prescribe the off-label medications that are going to help with their OBC. That's just, there's yeah, something there's, that. And I know there's people proposing potential legislature to, to make Ozempic tax sponsored so that my taxes would go to somebody else to take their Ozempic. And of course, Nova Nordisk and these other companies make their god-awful billions of dollars on the U.S. tax dollars, pack, pack, taxpayers' dime for this stuff. So it's... 
it's crazy that we're having well, this discussion. We've always been looking for the pill. We've always, that's the thing, that magic pill. And once you can get people over that, get some momentum in a direction that they, again, feel. If they can see it, feel it, you're measuring it, they're going to buy in. And you can talk all day, you can promote whatever, but until they actually get a result with what you're doing. And that's been my role as I started to discover actual truth. My role has been really to try to help people just come to an understanding that there's a better way. You're not fully screwed here. You can reverse some things. I know you've had problems for a long time, but there's a better way than just taking that next medication. In fact, getting healthier, in our opinion, means getting off medication and getting off medication, not adding more to it. So what can we do to get you off of that? And that's been my approach as a doctor of physical therapy to try and help people on the physical side of the equation. And that does include in the in their physical realm, that does include what they're eating, how they're living, how can they move very well? And if they can't, what do I need to do to help that? But I always have to go back to that, that fuel source that they're using because otherwise I'm going to be fighting against something and the less, the more I can get in that's good and that improve that, what you call tissue quality there, absolutely, I'm going to get a better outcome. And then not only do I get a better outcome in my clinic, but I've created a better human and they're out there spreading the word and they're living a better life. They're living longer, working with their kids or grandkids. And it's just an amazing, I, I live for that. And I love seeing people get that. They, they, they get it and they go, oh, wow, I didn't realize that what I was doing was causing so many problems and just this simple switch, it was hard to do. But once I got it done, wow, now I can sit on the floor again and I can get up, things like that. And there's even a nice study that showed that people that cannot do that or have a certain limitation, how much effort it takes them to get up. It's called the sitting rise test. There's a way you can determine about how long, how much longer you're going to live if you can't do that very well. So, yeah, I've got a lot of work to do in my area, and, and we're doing it. Yeah, it's, it's tougher to do that when you're carrying an extra 100 pounds around, too, for sure. Now, this is a thing that's, and I've said that before, when you are dependent upon the medical system, you're dependent on some drug, you're dependent on some prescriber to prescribe you that drug, it's very disempowering. You're, you're held captive. You're you're, you're outcome is dependent upon somebody else. And when you give them sort of the knowledge and power to fix it on their own with nutrition, it's so much more empowering. And I think it helps people. Wade, we're about out of time, man. Unfortunately, this, I could talk for quite a while longer, but let me, if if you don't mind, take a second, share a little bit about where people go to find, I know you got some social media, you got a, you say you got a radio program. Where do people go to learn more? I'm I'm getting back in. I've I've been very busy in the clinic and I'm getting back on social media quite a bit. So I'm at, on Instagram, I'm at Dr. Wade underscore physio. And then my blog is just drwade.com, D-R-W-A-D. And I'm just doing, I'm, I'm doing an article right now and we didn't talk about this and that's, but it'll be on my blog. I got off carnivore for about a year and I call it the family and friends diet. And my wife, I actually called it the Bethany diet and it, it makes her kind of mad. It really gets her going because she's like, that's not the way I eat. But anyway, I got a little off what I was doing to see what would happen. And I'm putting the results there and it was pretty astounding. And this is my first week back. And but that's a whole nother conversation. I did a little in one, a little research there. And it, I'm going to tell you right now, I'll never do that again. I will never do it again. <laughs> It was. Right, well, you learned, you learned oh, a lesson. Yeah, yeah. So, but yeah. I needed to see what would happen. I've been carnivore, been healthy, best health of my life for over five years. And I wanted to see what would it take if I just for about one year, what would happen? So it's on drwade.com and then drwade underscore physio. And I do D R W A D E. That's how I do the Dr. Wade things. I mean, I'm a doctor of physical therapy, not a physician. <laughs> so. All right, Dr. Wade Baskin, thank you very much. You have a great one. Thanks, and the rest of you thank folks. You, thank you, Dr. Sean Baker. Here. All right, my friend. Keep up Take the good work on your end, too. Pleasure.